Hi everyone, I'm Tammy. Welcome to Nutmeg Notebook. I'm the creator of this YouTube channel and the blog called Nutmeg Notebook. And we are whole plant-based, SOS-free, and we share all about our lifestyle. Now, SOS stands for salt, oil, and sugar, but don't panic, the food tastes great, I promise. I'm so excited today, and yes, I'll admit, I'm even a little bit nervous and starstruck because we have a very special guest in the house with us today. He is a superstar in the plant-based world, and I want to thank my friend and mentor, Chef AJ, for introducing us and helping make this interview possible. And AJ, if you're on, hi, honey. Our special guest is none other than Dr. Alan Goldhammer who is the founder of the True North Health Center, a state-of-the-art facility that provides medical and chiropractic services, psychotherapy and counseling, as well as massage and body work. He is also the director of the center's groundbreaking residential health education program. Articulate, inspiring, and energetic, Dr. Goldhammer is one of the most pioneering and dedicated visionaries in health today an outspoken professional who doesn't shy away from a spirited debate. And if you've ever seen him and Dr. Lyle on stage, you know what I'm talking about. He is deeply committed to helping people who are stuck in the destructive cycles reclaim their ability to change their lives. Dr. Goldhammer has supervised the fasts of thousands of patients. Under his guidance, the True North Health Center has become one of the premier training facilities for doctors wishing to gain certification in the supervision of therapeutic fasting. He is the author of the Health Promoting Cookbook. Yes, he has a cookbook even before I do. Great recipes in here, as well as the Pleasure Trap book. So thank you for joining us today and welcome Dr. Goldhammer. My pleasure, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. I want to give you a personal thank you for co-authoring this book. I was a yo-yo dieter for nearly four decades, almost my entire adult life. And it wasn't until I read this book that Chef AJ introduced me to that I finally discovered my brain wasn't broken. I thought there was something that was fundamentally wrong with me because I was trying to eat the standard right. American diet and eat all that garbage in moderation because that's what they told me I could right. do. And once I read this book, I found out that actually there was nothing wrong with my brain. I had the wrong diet. And so once I changed the food, it was like magic. The weight fell off and I've maintained my weight loss for five years, which is uh -huh. for me is incredible. So thank very good. you very much. Yeah, five years, you, you realize that that's the real thing when you've been able to sustain behavioral changes over that kind of period of time, that that's uh, changes that aren't going to go away. That's right. And, you know, um, unfortunately, most people don't have the opportunity to read those books like this, know the information that we finally have learned. And so that's why my husband and I have this YouTube channel. And our blog is we are so excited about this lifestyle that we want to help promote it and get the word out. You know, and even people that don't like to read now, chef AJ did a audio version of the pleasure trap and she did a fabulous job. And uh, actually that's the way I enjoy it the most is listening to it actually. So well, I, I, like think, that. Uh, I like that too, because I can be walking around. I can be doing different things while I'm listening to a book. I think that's fantastic. So can you talk to us about um, why you recommend a whole plant food diet without any added SOS? And I understand that you adopted this when you were quite young. Yeah, I did. Actually, I was very, very fortunate to um, come across works by people like Herbert Shelton and others that suggested that health was the result of healthful living and that healthful living involved diet, sleep and exercise. And so I thought, that would be a good thing. And I, I began to adopt these, these habits very early on. Actually, my goal was really to beat Dr. Lyle in basketball. I grew up with, with him. But, you know, as I've said many times, it failed terribly because he's adopted the same diet. He still beats me badly every time we play. So it wasn't successful in helping me beat Dr. Lyle, but it was successful in helping me figure out that, you know, diet played a very important role in terms of health, both long-term and short-term. 
And uh, it's been a, a fundamental part of our uh, success in helping people recover their health is applying a whole plant food SOS free diet. SOS, we actually meme, uh, formed that meme purposely for the idea of describing a plant-based or a vegan diet uh, in addition to the things you needed to do. You know, people go on vegan diets and they could be terribly unhealthy. You know, French fries, uh, soda pop, uh, all kinds of foods, uh, including things like Oreos can be vegan in that they don't have any animal foods, but they're full of oil, salt, and sugar. And oil and salt and sugar turn out to be actual chemicals, really not so much foods, but food byproducts, fractionated food byproducts that artificially stimulate dopamine in the brain, and dopamine being the neurochemical associated with pleasure. And so when people eat these chemicals, they overeat and they become overweight. And people that are overweight develop metabolic syndrome. And then they develop diseases like coronary artery disease and heart disease. They develop uh, diabetes. Uh, they develop autoimmune diseases and some forms of cancer. And so the key to reversing those diseases or preventing those diseases turns out to be controlling what you put in your mouth. And what we're suggesting is that what people should put in their mouth are exclusively whole plant foods. So fruits and vegetables, uh, minimally processed, non-glutinous grains, beans, nuts, and seeds. And what they shouldn't put in their mouth are the animal products. So the meat, fish, fowl, eggs, and dairy products, and the highly processed pleasure trap chemicals, the salt, the oil, and the sugar. And each of those chemicals has particular challenges in terms of uh, compromising people's health and ability to maintain optimum weight. So, you know, we can look at individual chemicals like salt and talk about the things that are relevant to that. We can talk about oil and we can talk about sugar. Yes, um, you, you know, sugar is the most commonly accepted now. I think most people realize refined carbohydrates and white sugar and all the sweeteners. Um, stimulate overeating and people become overweight and that's a problem. Uh, sugar also can affect the microbiome, the five pounds of bacteria that live in your intestinal tract. Now, to, to me, that's an amazing concept that in your body, you have five pounds of living organisms, a trillion living creatures scurrying around inside your intestinal tracts right now, drinking and eating and defecating inside you right now. So, you know, what those bacteria pull into you depends largely on what you feed them. So if you feed your bacteria soluble fibers like sweet potatoes, you get fertilizer, you get vitamin K and all kinds of stuff you need. You feed those bacteria animal foods, you get a completely different strain of, uh, type of bacteria strains living in you. And they give off different waste products. And they give off things like TMA, which is, becomes trimethylamine oxidase that irritates the animal lining of the vessels and leads to heart disease and cancer and other problems. So the point is it's important what you feed you, uh, and that includes what you feed your bacteria. We all know sugar is probably not a good thing. We, we talk about that. Recently, people have talked about oil being not a good thing, including olive oil and all the other oils, that these fractionated food byproducts have nine calories a gram. They don't provide normal satiety feedback, and they help people uh, get fat. In fact, Dr. McDougall is fond of saying that the fat you eat is the fat you wear because you can actually do a fat biopsy of somebody and actually tell what kind of fat they've been eating based on you know, what kind of molecules are in their fat cells. So uh, I think now sugar and oil have become more acceptable, but there's still another chemical that's added to food and that's salt. And people say, well, isn't salt an essential nutrient? Well, absolutely. Without sodium chloride, you die. In fact, it's so important. You've been designed to detect it at very small quantities so that you can pick up foods that contain it, like vegetables, and, and be attracted to them. The problem is in the modern world, we learn to fractionate and concentrate these chemicals, like sugar, like oil, and like salt. And just like sugar and oil, when you add fractionated salt to the food, you increase the sodium intake, and then you get problems, like high blood pressure and edema and swelling. And maybe amongst the problems, most important of all, may be the effect on the microbiome on those five pounds of bacteria you have living in your gut. We all know that salt is actually a very powerful preservative. That's how it was used traditionally. So it's not surprising when you dose yourself with large quantities of sodium chloride hidden in your food or added to your food, that it can have a profound effect on the bacteria living in your gut, just like it does in the environment and everywhere else. And so we believe that we're going to find in studies that are being done now that the people that are eating large amounts of these chemicals, the sugar, oil, and salt, have different bacteria. Bacteria give off different products. And it's an important part of your immune system. 
and how you defend yourself and how you regulate weight. Um, you know, currently we've got problems. People are dying from uh, the latest uh, infectious disease that's, that's spreading around right now. And you should ask yourself, how come most people that get COVID-19 recover? But some people get really ill and some die. What's different amongst the people that recover and those that get ill? Well, one of the big differences is metabolic syndrome, uh, obesity, diabetes, lipid values, blood pressure, et cetera. Uh, in addition to age, uh, that, and age really reflects more than anything, years of accumulated exposure to abuse. So if your immune system is compromised, including the microbiome that lives in your gut, you may be more vulnerable, not just to COVID-19, but to all the other organisms. Like right now, we're just about to come into influenza season. And so, you know, we'll have tens of thousands of people die from being exposed to influenza this year too. I don't know if it'll get as much attention as we are currently with the pandemic, but it's certainly pretty serious to all the people that are going to get influenza and the small percentage that are going to die as a consequence of their exposure. So salt, oil, and sugar are all important. You can't just get rid of the sugar or just get rid of the oil or just get rid of the oil and the sugar. You got to get rid of the sugar, the oil, and the salt. Now, does that mean you're not going to get any essential fats in your diet? No, you're going to get the fat you need from your whole foods. And some foods are really rich in fat, like um, nuts and seeds and, and uh, avocados and things like that. Uh, some foods are more moderate. Uh, in fat. But if you get a variety of foods, even if you don't eat the nuts and seeds, you can still get all your essential fatty acids by eating a, a good balance and particularly green vegetable material. Um, do you get enough car calories? Maybe if you don't eat sugar, you wouldn't get enough calories. You get too skinny and die. No. You get all the calories you need. You get all the carbohydrate you need from complex carbohydrates from whole plant foods. You don't need to add sugar. You don't need to add oil. And you don't need to add salt. You're going to get the gram or gram and a half a day of of sodium that you need from your diet. Because some foods, just like some foods are rich in fats, some foods are rich in sodium. For example, all your green vegetables, and particularly things like celery and tomatoes and chard. In fact, after fasting, people notice that the chard tastes salty. They think somebody added salt to it. But that's the way it always tastes. It's just not everybody can tell because their tastes are perverted by eating a salt, oil, and sugar contaminated diet. So let me ask you, since we're talking about the salt, the question that comes up from people when we um, tell them that we eliminate the extra sodium from our diet is they say, well, then how do you get your iodine since you're not eating the processed foods or we're purchasing canned tomatoes that are no salt added? Yeah. So where are we getting? Well, our remember, iodine didn't used to just be a chemical added to sodium chloride. Okay, right. so iodine was always present in whole plant foods. And if you eat a variety of vegetable-based foods, typically you do get the iodine that you need. However, if you live in the middle of the country and all of your food comes from the middle of the country, you don't get any of the food that from California, you know, you're just getting it all from your Minnesota soil, you would develop iodine deficiency because those soils that have never been covered by the ocean tend to be relatively low in iodine and plants don't have an inherent need for iodine in order to survive. So iodine is one of those minerals that can at least theoretically be low. And so what you do to make up for that is you don't have to poison yourself with salt to get some trace amount of supplemental iodine. You could take an iodine uh, rich foods, like you could use some sea vegetables, like some nori or some kelp in your diet, if you, if you chose to do that. Or if you didn't want to do that, you could add an iodine supplement. You wouldn't have to have it contaminated with sodium in order to be able to get enough iodine in your diet. And the fact is that people eating vegetable foods from the coast where iodine is rich in the soil, uh, typically get enough iodine from their plant-based foods so that, you know, it's really not a major issue. Okay. I noticed that you also mentioned um, glutinous free yes. uh, grains. And why is that? Why gluten? Well, it turns out that some people are very sensitive to gluten, a protein that's found in wheat, rye, and barley. And we've increased the amount of gluten in uh, some of the grains by our hybrid breeding techniques. And we've changed, like, for example, wheat is very different now than it was in the past in terms of the number of genes and how it functions because they've raised it in a way to make it really good for growing. And you, know, you get about 10 times as much yield per acre as you used to, better for machine harvesting, but not necessarily better for you. Uh, and 1% of the population have a disease called celiac disease, where the body's immune system becomes aggravated by gluten, and the immune system will attack your own colon. And that's what celiac disease is, your immune system attacking your colon. And so with celiac disease, everybody agrees, 
even medical doctors that typically you know are not that interested maybe in nutrition that the, a celiac patient must avoid gluten that's wheat rye barley gluten contamination well it turns out it's not only celiac patients that are sensitive to gluten uh, there's a, a gene associated with this. It's called the HLA-DQ gene, and it's associated with gluten sensitivity and also a condition called Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Mm -hmm. And Hashimoto's thyroiditis is a condition where the immune system attacks the thyroid. Now, instead of attacking the colon or the intestines, uh, the uh, immune system is attacking the thyroid gland. And eventually develops hy you develop hypothyroidism as a result of this autoimmune attack. And it's not coincidental that the same gene that of the people that have Hashimoto's thyroiditis or that have the same gene associated with gluten sensitivity. And what the theory is, is that when you eat gluten, some people's immune system attacks the colon uh, or intestines and we get celiac disease. Some pe people attacks the thyroid, they get thyroiditis. Other people notice that it attacks uh, mucous membranes they get sinusitis or osteoarthritis and other problems. So what we found is that a much more than 1% of the population, maybe as much as a third or more of the population actually have some sensitivities uh, to gluten. And what we've done is we've realized that first of all, the glutinous grains are almost always used in a processed form like bread and crackers and cookies and other, other kinds of formats, which people shouldn't be eating anyway. We we'll talk about that later. Um, but it's also easier just to eliminate those, glu those glutinous containing grains altogether from the diet. And that way, even the people that don't realize they're sensitive don't have to have exposure. And we use rice and we use millet and we use other grains that have uh, little or no gluten exposure, oats, et cetera. And we find patients overall do much better. And um, particularly if we use these foods as whole plant foods rather than highly processed fractionated flour-based products which increase caloric density and increase the tendency to overeat. So our recipe books, Health Morning Cookbook, the Bravo Cookbook, the Bravo Express Cookbook, uh, cookbooks like AJ's uh, cookbooks and Kathy uh, Fisher's book, Straight Up Cooking, all of these are vegan, SOS free, and generally little or no gluten is used so that people that are sensitive to these grains are able to easily avoid them. Okay, thank you. That's a great explanation. So since you touched on the thyroid, can we talk a little bit about the thyroid as well? So I am hypothyroid and I was actually diagnosed about a year into um, adopting this lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And people always, when they find out that I have hypothyroidism, they always ask me why my healthy diet didn't reverse it. Sure. I still take Did a small amount of um, levothyroxine every day. I get tested every year. And, um, but, but I don't know what to tell them. Well, one thing you need to know about hypothyroidism is it doesn't just develop in a few weeks or months. This is a condition uh, that develops over years. In fact, there's many conditions that are like that. You know, people have, uh, patients have gone on a vegetarian diet and a few weeks later, they'll develop a breast lump and they, when they're thinking maybe their breast cancer came from going on a healthy diet. But in reality, it's been, you know, 10 years or more that those lesions have been developing. The question is, it's disappointing that the, despite adopting a healthier diet, that wasn't enough to forestall uh, the breakdown of this uh, gland. And in your particular case, I can't say with certainty what exactly the variables are, but there's a lot of variables to consider in why a person develops hypothyroidism and why they develop much later or much earlier, much more severe whether they respond or not to diet and fasting or whether they'll continue to need some replacement therapy. So it's a fairly complex issue. It's not just thyroid. Of course, there's a whole neuroendocrine system involved. We measure, you know, a few things, uh, T3, T4, T7, TSH. We have a few tests that we measure, but there's actually all kinds of stuff behind that as well that can, can interplay with development. So let's just say this, that it is true that even on a healthy diet, people can still develop problems. They break ankles, they develop illnesses, uh, people can get sick. But the odds of problems go down, the recovery from problems goes up, and the incidence of those problems tends to diminish as people adopt healthier diets. But it's certainly not absolute protection, and certainly bad things can happen to good people even though they're doing the right thing. That's right. So uh, some people tell me that they read that um, people who have hypothyroidism should avoid cruciferous vegetables. Is that true? Well, as a whole, I would not agree with that. Most people that have thyroid problems do fine with 
cruciferous vegetables. However, it is true that some people have sensitivities to anything. I mean, almost all even healthy foods, there are people that will be sensitive to those. And so people should avoid foods that they're sensitive to or rotate foods that they're sensitive to so that they don't get untoward reactions. And it's always good to pay attention to what you can or can't handle. But in my experience working with hundreds of hypothyroidist uh, patients, most are able to handle the whole variety of vegetable-based foods with limited problems. However, if you have one person that has a sensitivity, they decide that everybody's now sensitive. And so they write a book and, you know, that's the okay. beginning of. Thank you. So Elizabeth wanted to know, she had to have her thyroid removed and she wants to know, can she still be a healthy person without a thyroid? Yes. It's very important though, when you don't have a thyroid that you get your thyroid dosing exactly right. If you're on thyroid replacement therapy, you want to work with a doctor that's, you know, going to be paying attention and monitoring because if you're on more thyroid uh, uh, medication than you need, you get osteoporosis and other problems. It puts you at increased risk for problems. If you're on too little, you feel like crap. So that's not good either. You want to be just right. Now, the problem is the healthier you get, sometimes the less you need. And so some people are on a certain dosage and doing great, but then they adopt these whole plant food diets and find they need less medication despite aging. Um, sometimes it's because of weight loss, sometimes it's because thyroid function is improving, um, but you just have to pay attention. And that's why, particularly if you're going to be on medications, it helps to work with doctors that aren't complete idiots. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, so when we were talking about when we adopt the, a whole plant food diet that is um, free of added SOS, I know you and Dr. Lyle talk about a period of, of um, neuroadaptation. Yes. And so um, Susan wrote in and she wants to know uh, if you could explain what it is and how it happens. Yeah. Well, that's a really good question. Uh, the, probably the person that could give you the more detailed explanation would be uh, people like Dr. Tasha Myers, our research director, or my wife, Dr. Jennifer Renner, who re reads all the textbooks and actually understands it. But I can tell you is how it looks and, and describe what we see clinically. Um, for example, if you go from a bright lit area into a dark theater, you know, remember the days when you used to go inside the theaters to watch movies and stuff? Yeah, well... If you walk in at first, you can't see very well and you're stepping on people and, you know, uh, all that kind of stuff. And then after a while, you settle down and your eyes neuro adapt. The rods and cones in the back of your eyes adapt to the limited light and you can actually see who you're sitting next to and what's going on. That's an example of adapt neuroadaptation. Well, the same thing happens, for example, with taste. So if you're used to a greasy, fatty, slimy, dead, decaying flesh, salted diet, you don't like the taste of whole natural foods. It's disgusting, tasteless swill. But if you eat the disgusting, tasteless swill long enough, in the case of sodium, about a month, if you eat a low sodium diet for about a month on average, the, neuro, the taste buds begin to adapt and now you can detect the smaller quantity of sodium uh, in the whole natural foods and it, and it tastes good. So what used to be tasteless now begins to taste good. Unfortunately, some things it take longer than that to adapt. For example, low fat diets. If you're used to a high fat diet, you don't feel satisfied after you eat a low fat meal. You're used to this really high fat satiating material. So when you eat, say, healthy fruits and vegetables and stuff, you feel you're not exactly hungry, but you know there's something missing. You're not satiated and you want something, not a, you know, like peanut brittle or ice cream or something with a lot of fat in it. So the idea is that process of adapting to a low fat diet can take as much as three months, according to the literature. So you can imagine how difficult it is for people when they go on this diet and for the first week or two or month or two, don't feel satisfied. And they feel like they're going to feel like that forever. And it's never going to go away. And life's not going to be worth living. And they might as well just, you know, wrap it up. So the good news is if you're patient or you get the benefit of speeding this process up with something like fasting, you can make this adaptation where now you like the taste of good food. That's one of the big benefits of fasting is after fasting, people, good foods taste good again. And so it makes it easier to eat a good food, good healthy food diet that's high in nutrient density, low in caloric density, and then it makes it easier for people to lose weight. And then they describe it as a miracle because after all these years of struggling and fighting and trying to portion control and weighing and measuring and doing all this stuff that doesn't work, finally now all they'd have to do 
is eat large volumes of low density food. They feel satisfied. They can lose the weight. They recover their health. And the only problem they have to deal with is they become social outcasts because so many people don't like them anymore with them and their thin clothes and their perky smile make them sick. <laughs> that is so true. Okay. So since we're on that subject, uh, uh, let's talk about water fasting at True North. Who is a good candidate? What is it like? And have you ever water fasted? Yeah, I water fast every year and I hate it. <laughs> okay. uh, well, you know, with fasting, you have to rest. You can't play basketball. You got to give up a lot. I don't like that. I like doing my regular routine. When I fast, I've been fortunate enough to be living on a whole plant food SOS free diet since I've been a teenager. And so I don't get any symptoms per se. I'm not, you know, going through the withdrawal effect of drugs or caffeine or alcohol or tobacco or the processed foods or any of that stuff. So it's, it's relatively uneventful in terms of the fasting process, but the, the, the enforced rest, the lack of ability to engage in normal activities, I definitely, I see as a, as a sacrifice. I don't like to have to do that, but I, I do it because I know that it's helpful. In fact, I think the people that get the most benefit of fasting are actually healthy people using it for relatively shorter periods of time, that five to 10 days kind of range. Uh, to prevent problems and, and be proactive. Uh, although most of the patients we treat are ill, sometimes seriously ill, and willing to do anything, even eat well, exercise and fast in order to recover their health. So we treat a lot of diabetes and hypertension and autoimmune disease and cancer. And so these patients are motivated by pain, debility and fear of death. But I'm seeing an increasing percentage of patients now that are doing it preventatively and health promotionally. And although the fasts are not as entertaining uh, because you know, it was pretty uneventful. Um, I still think they're tremendously beneficial. And we're about to embark on a study actually that's gonna look at this very topic, which is how, what are the biomarkers that predict health and how does fasting and diet affect those biomarkers? Because what we're looking to do is try to help people avoid the last 10 or 20 years of debility that the average person spends, you know, oftentimes miserable and, and spending tremendous amounts on medical care unnecessarily because they develop these diseases that we believe are preventable. And I think that diet, sleep, exercise, and fasting may be the tools that are necessary to help people avoid that so they can live a good life and then die a good death with a short period of debility where they go to bed one night and don't wake up instead of spending the last 10 years of their life unable to talk or move lying in some nursing home bed waiting for people to come and change their diaper. Right. Well, I mean, I wanna live a long life but only if it, if it's one where I have quality of life. Yeah. And so um, do you also- What you want is a hot, you want to increase your healthy life expectancy, Thanks. not just your life expectancy, how long you live, but your healthy life expectancy, how well you're going to live healthfully. And that's the big promise of healthful living. Not that you're going to live forever. You won't believe me. You're going to die. Right. But the, the pure, the, the, not only you live to your full potential, but you can live until you die. Live fully functional and autonomous, independent. That's the promise of healthful living, to increase the odds of living healthily and decrease the odds of having years of unnecessary debility. Okay, thank you. I, I agree with that, and I'm excited about that. So do you think that fasting also has any um, effect then also on cancer cells? Let's, you know. Um, well, we, we know, in fact, it does appear to have an effect on cancer cells both intermittent fasting and the work that Walter Longo does in animal and human studies. And we published a paper recently in the British Medical Journal on the successful resolution of follicular lymphoma stage three. Uh, and we have a three-year follow-up that's also been published. We've now been tracking a number of other patients with this type of cancer, and they also appear to be doing well. We're waiting for some long-term outcome data to be able to publish a cohort. And ultimately, we'd like to be able to do a clinical trial. And we believe that we'll find that the combination of diet, sleep, exercise, and fasting can be an effective management strategy for these conditions. Okay, that's exciting news. So how has the pandemic affected the protocols of True North on a daily basis? Well, it's been incredibly disruptive because uh, all of our foreign patients had to cancel because they don't want Americans now in foreign countries. In fact, I understand they're building a wall between us and China to keep us. I uh, know. Well, anyway, our, our Canadian patients, our European patients, our Australian patients all have had difficulty coming uh, to do fasting. So we lost about 15% of our normal patient population uh, because of that. 
Uh, some people became nervous about traveling on airplanes using public transportation. Uh, and so that was a challenge. What we found ironically was that we ended up increasing the number of local people that found their way to us in part because of this new work at home uh, uh, ethic allowed people that maybe wouldn't have been able to take off enough time to do uh, their stays to be able to come to the center and still carry on some level of, of remote function. And that's allowed uh, increasing numbers of patients uh, to be able to come to the center and participate. And so ironically enough, we're seeing a lot more local people now than we've ever seen, and but no foreign folks. And, and so the net result has been fine. It's just, uh, it's been a change in our, in our population. Um, and we also um, ran into problems with um, managing our outpatient practices. We have a dozen clinicians at the center, but fortunately, uh, because of the new traditions of telemedicine, we put in a robust health coaching system at the True North Health Center where people can go online, find out about their doctors, pick, pick an appointment, uh, deal with it all online. They can download all of their medical records to us through email. Uh, that can all be reviewed. And now, very conveniently, anybody can have an appointment with any of our attending physicians affordably, quickly, and easily through our phone coaching service. And now that's increased uh, tenfold. So now we're seeing a lot more people taking advantage of getting that second opinion or getting that ongoing encouragement or getting somebody to yell at them, if, as the case may be, to kind of encourage them to do the right thing uh, without having to schlep to the office or expose themselves to goodness knows what and um, also without the limitations of travel. So we're finding that our coaching and consulting practice is actually increasing dramatically. And all of that is, you know, it's, it's so easy. They just go onto the website and it's right there and they just click and, you know, it takes care of it at all. It's the same process they've been using to register for coming to the True North Health Center and all of our doctors share all of their records. So it's a very nice integrated system. And so that way, if they want to talk to a psychologist or if they want to talk to a medical doctor or a chiropractor, you know, we've got uh, people being in, have a shoulder injury and they, they'll go online with one of our sports medicine doctors. We have two excellent uh, sports medicine chiropractors and they can give them links to the corrective exercises they need to do. They can watch them doing it through Zoom. They can show them how to do the correction without ever actually even being there to touch them. They can actually get them the information they need oftentimes to uh, help with the rehabilitation. There are still some things that cannot be done well remotely. One is long-term water only fasting that really needs to be done in a controlled setting. Number two, um, you know, the manual therapies, the massage, the manipulation, these things, I haven't figured out yet how to, how to adjust somebody over the phone. Um, but many things, particularly the services the medical doctors provide can be done quite acceptably. Um, there's even tools now where we can look at EKGs and other things through the Apple iPhone. And, you know, it's amazing the amount of technology that's available in terms of getting information and feedback. And also a lot of our doctors will work in conjunction with a local doctor. So they'll go to the doctor with their insurance to get their testing done and whatever, but then they'll have somebody to talk to them about interpreting that information in a way that might be more meaningful to them. So the pandemic, I think, has been a mixed blessing. It's been terrible for some of our patients that can't get access to the center. It's been a fabulous new experience for some that hadn't been before. And for us as an organization, it's forced us to become a much more effective and efficient operation. And I think in the long run, it's going to be a real blessing. So at the center during the pandemic, are you still having your, um, the cooking demonstrations and the lectures? We've put in a new system where we can broadcast, um, all of our videos, we have a Roku channel now. So all of our videos are on True North TV, which is a Roku channel, and people can get passwords freely to that through our website. Um, and so when, once they go on the website and they get that password, they'll be able to access all of our recorded videos for free, whether they're at the center or at home. And we also have a new system we're launching here um, this next week, which is a Vimeo-based live broadcast, again, through the website. So they'll be able to watch the videos from the rooms when they're at the center or at home after they leave the center. They'll still be have uh, access to our daily live coaching and Q&A sessions. Um, and so that way people can participate live in a, in a socially spaced setting. They can watch in their rooms 
or they can watch from home after they leave. So we've dramatically expanded our educational offerings and those are all coming online by the end of this month. And so all they have to do is go to our website at healthpromoting.com and they could register, get a password and it's all without cost. That's exciting. Thank you for doing that. I have a question for you on the remote coaching services. Is that open to people who live in states outside of California? It's open any, to anybody in the world. Wow. Now, there's a limitation. There's two types of things that are done on the phone. There's telemedicine, which is just standard medicine, which has to be done with people you already have a relationship with, you know, in established relationships. And there is no restriction on that. They can do whatever they have to do. With phone coaching, they, you can come, call in from anywhere in the world. You do not have to have relationships with any of the doctors, but they will not write prescriptions. They will not make a diagnosis over the, over the internet. And so that means if you're looking for a marijuana prescription or you're looking for uh, oxycodone or some kind of narcotic, we're not the place to come. We're not going to be writing prescriptions or making diagnoses. If you're coming to get genuine advice about how you can interpret what's been told to you or you know, what, what questions you might need to ask your local doctor, et cetera, then we're a really good resource for you. Okay. That sounds great. So um, Vicki lives out of the country and she wrote in and she wanted to know how do you get low conscientious people to adhere to a healthy eating? She knows that Dr. Goldhammer prefers really sick people because they have the most to gain by going to true north. But what about for those who don't want to get to that point before they change? Right. So maybe well, in my experience, yeah, pain, debility, and fear of death are the best motivators. So I always like patients that are motivated by pain, debility, and fear of death. Now, it is possible to motivate some people that are healthy. Uh, and they do it usually, they may be driven by moral, ethical, or spiritual goals. That's why a lot of people become vegetarians or vegans, because they want to save the planet. They want to save the animals. They want to save uh, the environment. So that motivates some people, and they can be good, good patients. Not quite as good as people driven by pain, debility, and fear of death, in my experience. But you can't have everything. So... Uh, sometimes people do it intellectually. They understand that they want to have a good life now and they want to have a good life then and they want to have a good death when the time comes and not be debilitated. And so that'll motivate them. I, I do remember um, one patient came to me. He was 65 years old. He had just retired and he smoked. He drank. He was a meat eater, ate almost no vegetables, never exercised, wasn't healthy and was really mean. And so I didn't ask, you know, too many questions because I was a new doctor at the time, but he came in, he fasted, he quit smoking and drinking, gave everything up, he cleaned himself up, was a whole lot less mean when he was done. And I asked him at that point when I wasn't quite so afraid of him, why he had decided to do it. And he said he had done the math. And he said he had just retired and realized in order to get his money back from retirement, he had to live to be 82 years old. And he knew he wasn't going to make it smoking and drinking and carrying on. And he was going to get every damn penny back from the sun. <laughs> and that's why he did it, because he wanted to make sure he got his money back. So for him, it worked. I saw him years later. He continued to do well. So, you know, I don't really care what your motivation is, but I do know you need motivation. So you better get clear in your head why it is you're willing to pay the price of getting healthy, adopting a health promoting diet and lifestyle, giving up your addictions and dependence, and sometimes giving up friends. There are people you know that are what I call energy vampires, and there are people that do what they do best, and that's make other people as fat and sick and miserable as they are. So by comparison, they don't have to feel so bad, and they will try to undermine your success everywhere you go. Those people have to go. You have to pick people. They don't all have to eat good. They don't have to do exactly what you're doing, but they have to let, at least let you do it. If you're a recovered alcoholic, you don't expect all of your friends to all quit drinking necessarily, but you do expect them to respect your need to have support uh, to not be drinking and not give you a hard time because you're choosing not to drink. So your friends don't all have to get thin and healthy, but they do have to at least tolerate that you're doing your best to try to be healthy. And if they can't do that, maybe it's time to cultivate some new friends. I know my mother, I always loved to tell my mom story when she was turned 92 she had outlived all 52 of her lifelong friends. They all died, including the ones that used to make fun of her diet and, and the rest of it. And she said to me, she said, Alan, you need to warn your patients. If they're going to do this kind of diet, make younger friends. <laughs> and she said, much younger. Because, you know, the reality is 
one of the prices you're going to pay for adopting a health-promoting diet is you're going to age out at a much lower rate than many of the people you know. And they'll be convinced it's just you're just lucky. You got good genes or whatever it's going to be. They're not going to attribute it to your conscious choices, and that's okay. And they don't have to do it, but they do have to at least tolerate you doing it. And if they can't do that, then I'm not so sure that, you know, you should invest the last uh, 30 or 40 years of your life cultivating friends that can't be supportive of your success. Well, we're going to outlive them all, all of our friends, probably. Um, thank you so much. So um, Marty wrote in for her uh, 57 year old sister who was just diagnosed with stage two breast cancer. And they watched your rich roll podcast that you did recently. And so she's curious about doing some fasting. She's supposed to start um, chemotherapy later this month. Uh, she wonders if it would be okay for her to not, not medically supervise, but to do a fast on her own at home for three or four days or would that be so, risky? What we recommend is that people fast every day for 16 hours and limit their feeding window to eight hours for those that are trying to maintain or lose weight. Uh, when you need to go longer than that, then there's some things that need to be done. Number one, you need a proper history exam, baseline lab, and you need daily monitoring. If that's going to be done at home and it needs to be done in conjunction with the doctor that's supervising her care, we have doctors that can help uh, support those physicians that are interested in helping patients get through a medically supervised fast. I wouldn't recommend longer term water fasting, and particularly for a patient in her situation. The real question, number one, she has to ask, and this is what every patient has to ask when they are given a cancer diagnosis. They need to ask their oncologist if there's any evidence that they can share with them that suggests that if they undergo this treatment, chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, whatever it is, that people on average lived longer or better if they did it than if they didn't. Whereas you want some evidence that if you're going to go through the high risk medical procedures, that there's a chance you may live longer or better because you did that. And the way you tell that is you look at studies where they took stage two breast cancer patients and a bunch of them got surgery, a bunch of them didn't get surgery, some of them got chemo, some of them, and what were the outcome data? And when you look at the data, and if it says, for example, that people didn't live any longer on average, whether they treated or not, then you have to ask some serious questions about, well, which treatment do I want to do if I'm not going to live any longer with or without treatment, then am I going to live better with or without treatment? And if I'm not going to live better than with or without treatment, why am I doing the treatment? And if I am going to do the treatment, is there anything I can do to mitigate negative effects? For example, fasting can be used, according to Walter Longo, before, during, and after fast, uh, chemotherapy and dramatically enhance the success of chemotherapy and reduce the side effects. And there's reasons why they believe that's true. We know that cancer cells don't metabolize carbohydrates in the same way um, that uh, regular cells do. And in a carbohydrate deficient environment, like in the fasting state, in that ketotic state, they can't compete well. And it makes chemotherapy work better at killing off the cancer cells. And fasting also may help protect cancer, uh, healthy cells from the devastating effects of chemotherapy uh, or radiation. And so as a consequence, fasting may be used to protect the body from the devastating effects of conventional therapy. But the first question is, should we be doing the therapy to begin with? And certainly, if physicians believe that the treatment they have is a safe and effective way, or at least an effective way of helping people live longer, they'd be more than happy to share that evidence with you. And you can also read a book like uh, The Emperor of All Maladies, written by a Harvard oncologist, Mukherjee, who talks a lot about cancer and its treatment and how much of the treatment that's been offered doesn't make people live longer, doesn't make people live better. And as a consequence, you have to wonder, why the heck are we doing it? Now, fortunately, there's new therapies coming along that sometimes are less invasive, less damaging. Some of the immunotherapies um, seem to be um, helpful and at the same time being less hurtful in some cases. And so it may be you can discuss with your doctor what your options for conventional medical therapy are. The good news is that the alternative approach is always relevant, whether, whatever you're doing, whether you're chemo, radiation, surgery, don't surgery, whatever you decide to do there, getting on a healthy diet and lifestyle, sleep, exercise, and possibly fasting may all have uh, a role that can be applied. One of the things I've noticed lately, we have a doctor on our staff, Dr. Chilla Veras, is a naturopathic physician who does a lot of work with patients that are suffering with or went through chemotherapy and have side effects from the treatments and trying to avoid the treatment. And she does a lot of 
uh, coaching uh, with those patients. And I tend to have them consult with her because she's also aware of a lot of the alternative medicine, naturopathic stuff that's available in addition to the diet and lifestyle stuff to help mitigate some of the side effects uh, of these treatment protocols. And it gets complicated. But the question was, should a person go and do a water fast on their own at home without guidance and support? And my answer would be no. I think 16 hours a day, yes. Eat healthy every day, long-term fasting, consult with a doctor that, that's familiar with the use of fasting. And they could contact you at True North and do um, a consult. Are you still doing? I do. I offer a no cost phone conversation to help steer people in the right direction and determine whether anything that we do or recommend might be relevant. And all they do is fill out the same forms on the website they would if they're doing phone coaching. And, uh, but then uh, I call them back and, and there's no cost for a conversation. And what I will do is give them the best advice I can, let them know if what we do might be relevant. If there's a doctor that's particularly uh, uh, experienced in their particular condition or skill, I'll try to refer them to that. If they want to fast, but they want to do it at a, a location closer to home, I can refer them to doctors that we've trained that are good in their areas. We have one doctor in Ohio. We have an excellent doctor in uh, Orange County, Nathan Gershfeld uh, is doing a real good job down there. So there are people other than us that are able to help you with the fasting supervision, but fasting supervision at the very least needs to be done in conjunction with a doctor, your doctor, that is at least familiar with your case and that can, that can make sure that you're monitored and guided properly so you don't make a mess of it and make fasting look bad. Okay, thank you. So I have a question for you on the um, practice of intermittent fasting that you're talking about. Does it matter what hours that you feed and yeah, you, you need to stop eating three hours before you go to sleep. Okay. And then you want to, you know, and that doesn't mean staying up till 3 a.m. so you can eat till midnight. You go to bed at your normal time, hopefully relatively early. You, you make sure you haven't eaten past. And so let's say you go to bed at 10, 10 p.m. You wouldn't eat anything after 7 p.m. And then you wouldn't eat again in the morning if you, if it was, you know, 7 p.m. was your, was your meal. Then you would wait again till, you know, in that case, 16 hours would be 11. So you'd have a late breakfast or early lunch. You'd have your, your feeding window in that 11 to seven. If you get to bed a little earlier, if you stop eating a little bit earlier, then you would be able to uh, begin the morning meal a little bit earlier. And so, but that, that's a pretty good rule of thumb for people. 16 hours of fasting, eight hour feeding window um, uh, will work well for a significant number of people. And my experience is the earlier you finish up supper, usually the better off it is. Yeah, I feel better when I do the intermittent fasting. You know, there was um, there were a lot of plant based doctors that were advocating, uh, you know, you have to eat breakfast. And so I actually I tried that <clears throat> for a while, and it really didn't work well for me. That was actually an advertising campaign from the cereal industry. I don't think it ever had any basis <laughs> in fact or in science. So, thank you for clarifying that because you know I was feeling bad that I wasn't eating breakfast, but it doesn't work for me. Intermittent fasting works so much better. Um, Karen wrote, and she wanted to know if a totally raw diets that do include only cooked beans and legumes, are they healthful? Well, a raw diet that cooks beans and uh, contains cooked beans and legumes is a raw diet with a cooked diet. That's what we're advocating. Raw and cooked fruits mm -hmm. and vegetables, grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. I don't advocate a hundred percent raw food diet over the long run for most people because those diets tend to be harder to maintain caloric density you know, once you've reached your optimum weight, because fruits and vegetables are very low caloric density, you have to eat many, many pounds a day. Uh, and it tends to be high sugar, high fat. What a lot of raw foodists do is they pour a lot of olive oil on stuff and serve alcohol. So that's not a good thing, dried fruits and processed foods. What we'd rather you do is have, you know, more or less one fruit and two vegetable based meals, lots of steamed starchy vegetables, small amounts of all those and uh, just don't eat anything else. You know, a real simple, simple way for most people is to just go inside themselves and ask themselves one question. Do they really want and need whatever it is they're thinking about? And if the answer is truly yes, they can't have it because they get nothing. You don't get anything you really, really, really want because that's what the pleasure trap is calling out to you. Yes, you'll like carrots, but you're not going to get up at night and have to get out of the store and bang on the guy's door because you ran out of carrots. You can, you can get, wait till morning. So the, the things that people really, really want are usually more of a drug-like effect. Fruit, salads, steamed vegetables, potatoes, rice, beans, nuts, and seeds. You'll like it. You'll enjoy eating, believe me. But you won't have a drug-like 
uh, effect. You won't have your blood sugars bouncing all over the place. You won't be getting cravings. You won't be having to fight with yourself. You can overcome some of these eating challenges and difficulties, and you don't have to spend your life having to fight with yourself. You can actually just shove up the shove the feeding bag full three times a day, a low density food, and let it go. And that's a sense of power and control that many people find is really incredibly powerful. And you can achieve your weight and your health and become a social outcast. <laughs> Something to look forward to. I don't know. Our numbers are growing, though, Dr. Goldhammer. There's so many of us now that are eating this way that we no longer have to be the social outcast. I have to tell you, my attitude about um, these podcasts has really changed uh, in recent weeks. Um, I, I went on um, Rich Roll's show with him. And Rich is a wonderful guy. I was really fortunate to go down there. I, uh, I think uh, Chef AJ hooked me up with him. And uh, I went down to his studio and we did a talk and I really enjoyed it. He's a really interesting guy. But so far, um, over half a million people have watched this you know, in-depth broadcast. Well, and I, I used to t talk a lot to groups, you know, 100 at a time. Well, when you do the math, if you talk to 100 people a group every week, that's 5,000 people a year. So I would have had to do that for 100 years to reach <laughs> the audience that that one talk I did with Ritual. And it was interesting. He called it the crazy benefits of fasting with Dr. Goldhammer. And then they put it on like the YouTube and then you watch the YouTube and how hundreds of thousands of people watch it. So now I realize in terms of getting a message out, this media right here is about as good as it gets because people are able to, at their own time and convenience, without cost, gain access to a wide variety of information. And so including if they find the information that our experience is, is valuable, we can get that out. Well, 5,000 years of weekly lectures <laughs> or one talk for an I mean, hour and you didn't even have to you know yeah. yeah i mean it's like it's it's almost unbelievable how how can that work that way and what's been even more interesting is i know people are listening because i've had hundreds of contacts in the past couple of weeks just from that one um exposure where people are you know calling in and have really good questions and they're following through and interested in fasting and doing all that stuff so it's not like it's out there and but people aren't seeing it. People are watching podcasts. They are watching these, these things. They have a live time and then they have the, the afterlife. You know, you see, I get comments from people talking about a talk that I, have, I don't even remember giving us, you know, five years ago, but they're just now getting a chance to see it. And we're seeing the same thing with a lot of the, the movies that are coming out. You know, movies like What the Health and these uh, new ones that are coming out. We just did a uh, Netflix did a show here at the center that they told us was on alternative medicine and we were going to call it wellness. Well, they ended up calling it unwell because it turned out it was actually an attack on alternative medicine, but it turns out we were the other side of the story. And so in that Netflix unwell series, the fourth video they did on fasting, they filmed a bunch of it at the center and I think they, you know, they tried to do a fair presentation of the work that we were doing and didn't trash us too much. And as a consequence of that, now I'm noticing large numbers of people that wouldn't have otherwise heard about us being exposed. So this, this new media is really, I think, a very powerful tool. And, and I'm glad to see you being able to take this information and reach out to that hyper health market of people that are really serious about getting healthy, not just looking for magic pills and potions but actually serious about what, what the hard work is they're going to need to do if they want to get and stay healthy. Yeah, absolutely. And people, because of the pandemic, they have the time right now to watch these podcasts and videos because they don't have anything else that they can go do right now. And right. So, so instead of going to the bar and getting drinking alcohol, they're actually getting educated. Gee, so maybe it's not all bad with the pan. You know what the worst part of the pandemic, in my opinion, is besides all the death and debility and everybody losing their jobs and all that. The worst part, from my viewpoint, besides that, basketball gyms are closed. Oh, <laughs> you're having there's no mock warfare. <laughs> now I go shooting. In fact, I just shot about an hour ago. I went out and hit my. I do my my. I have a series of stuff I do. Uh, as much as possible every day. And so I hit my shots. I got to hit so many from each of these places before I can move on and stuff. 
actually for a while I was, I was thinking, oh my gosh, I hope I'm going to get there on time. But anyway, it's not the same thing though as engaging as social interchange when you, when you do basketball. And so I really want this pandemic over. So they reopen the gym so I can get back with, uh, with the guys before they get too old to play. That's right. And maybe, maybe Dr. Lyle will be back by then. Oh yeah. He'll come back and he'll beat me again. <laughs> you probably will. Hey, can I ask you one more um, food related question? Sure. Uh, Regina wants to know, and I actually, I met Regina at True North Health Center um, when Tom and I were there last um, December. She wants to know, how do you feel about the flavored balsamic vinegars that don't have any added sugar? Okay, well, the flavored balsamic vinegars, almost all are sugar pop vinegar. <laughs> so, and the way you can tell is you go look at that label and you look at how many calories there are per tablespoon. And most of them have 45 or 30 or 20 or, you know, uh, some of them are a little bit lower, 15 or five or zero. So actual vinegar doesn't have any grape mist, which is basically sugar. Okay. okay. So now we've gone at True North Health. Um, I didn't actually realize this uh, some years ago, what they were exactly doing. Then I got a little bit educated. So now we have narrowed down our uh, selection of vinegars so that they have either zero calories Per tablespoon or up to I think it's 15 calories so just a trace amount of uh, grape mist but the soda pop uh, vinegars you know 45 tablespoons uh, calories per tablespoon some of that vinegar had more calories than the whole salad depending on how much vinegar you put on there so let's not kid ourselves that if we put a bunch of sugar into something and we like it that that makes it good now if you want to make make um, vinegars that don't have the grape mist then I'm all for it and I, in fact I know that the uh, um, the company that uh, AJ is working with is working really hard to try to come up with a base that doesn't require the sugar in order to be acceptable. And as soon as they do, you know, it's not the flavors that's the problem. It's the sugar that's the problem. So as soon as they come up with a version that's, that's uh, low enough in, uh, in sugar, then we'll be happy to endorse it and get behind uh, increasing it. Because it certainly adds some variety for people. But you can use plain vinegars right now that don't have any calories, any great mist, you can use lemon juice, you can use grapefruit juice. So there's acids that you can use that make a pe peeling uh, taste. And if you eat the salad long enough, eventually you don't even need much because you like the taste of the salad. But that just is a question of getting that adaptation kicked in. Absolutely. That is so true. So I recently learned, um, uh, I was talking to uh, Wanda from the National Health Association yes. and found out that you are on the board of directors for that. And they are going to be having their conference in Ohio um, in next June, as long as everything works out well. And you're going to be a speaker there. And my husband, Tom, and I will be there. And I'm actually going to um, see you there because I will be doing a cooking demonstration as well. And so in the show links, um, the links under the show notes here, we have put links to True North Health Center and the National Health Association. And if people want to sign up for the magazine or to um, sign up for the conference for next June, there is a really wonderful group of speakers. We're gonna be able to listen to Dr. Goldhammer again. And I can't thank you enough for giving us this hour of your time today. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. And you know, there's a lot of other things going on out there right now. I know that Chef AJ um, is also, you know, actively involved in supporting people uh, remotely too. And so, you know, there's lots of things to log into, to check into, uh, that can be in, encouraging, enhancing. And actually I've been educated about the importance of that as well. Is that her new book? Yes. Oh, excellent. This is Chef AJ's new book. And actually, I'm glad you brought it up because today is the last day that you can um, sign up to get, if you order this book, you take your receipt and you send it to Chef AJ Bonus at yahoo.com. And then you will get the free bonuses. And one of the bonuses is the audio audio chapters of this book. So somebody like Dr. Goldhammer, who prefers to listen to the audio book, 
I'm okay. getting my coupon in because I want to listen to it in the car. That's what I want to do. Well, there you go. That's I cool. want to hear it driving to work. You know, the other thing you can do is get that audio version and then, you know, go on a trip with somebody you love, but throw all the D- CDs out and stuff and just listen to the book. So that'll be a way to get them educated. There you go. I love that. It's a great idea. No, we want to thank Chef AJ for um, connecting us so that we could have this wonderful conversation today and for all the wonderful things that she does and her online program is a really wonderful program to follow up after you've been to true north and absolutely your water fast well you know because we had problems where people would come do well at true north but have some struggle going home and you know that's why uh, i said well the obvious answer is just don't let people go home anymore just keep them all at true north forever but they said that wasn't practical and so that's why we've come up with the the, the Roku channel, the remote broadcast. That's why there's group like Chef AJ's. That's why there's podcasts like this to try to increase the educational outreach and support for people. Cause you live in a world designed to make you fat, sick and miserable. And in order to get healthy, you're going to have to overcome all of those challenges and escape the pleasure trap. That's right. And so her online program is called feel fabulous over 40 and people can actually try it for free for two weeks. I don't know, you know, any of anyone else who's allowing people to do that. So you get to test it out and see if you like it. And then also from, um, we want to mention these two books from the chef at true North health center. These are fabulous books. Yep. And, um, I just really, and this, uh, Bravo Express is his newest cookbook, which everything has five ingredients or less. It cooks really quick and easy. They're easy enough. Even I can make these. So that's really good. And this was the original Bravo cookbook, which has some really good recipes in it. Um, there's some excellent dressings. It's, you know, both of those books are, are real solid. And uh, we're real pleased with those. And they're all vegan, SOS free. You can see it right there on the label, yep. SOS free. Yep. And we've linked to these in the show notes for everyone so that they can find those as well. So thank you so much, Dr. Goldhammer. We really appreciate it. Um, Stay well. Keep doing all the good work there in Santa Rosa. And we hope to come see you again someday. Thanks everyone for watching. If you like this program, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. And next Sunday at this same time, we will have the nutrition professor here interviewing her. That is Timory Hagenberger. And she is a registered dietitian. She also um, conducts a a plant-based nutrition class at uh, one of our local colleges. And so we'll be talking to her. She also has a wonderful SOS free cookbook. And we'll be talking to her about how to transition your kids, any of your nutrition questions. You can send those to Tammy at nutmegnotebook.com or tom at nutmegnotebook.com. And we will have a really fun and entertaining Q&A with her. So Tom, is there anything else that we need to address? Uh, no, we're all set for the week. Uh, Dr. Goldhammer, I think, is on, has gone on his way. OK. He looks like he can make it. Um, if you want to check things over there, you can. And if anybody has any last minute stuff for you that we didn't get to. Yeah, so you guys do order Chef AJ's book. You still, you have um, yet till tonight. You want to get this ordered and then send your, um, your, a copy of your receipt to Chef AJ Bonus at yahoo.com. You will get the audio version. You'll get um, extra recipes, 25 extra recipes. Plus you're going to get a recipe for a um, double layer cake with that's frosted that Chef AJ came up with. So, and I have seven recipes in this book. So, um, and the recipes are amazing. The, the, um, commentary in here is funny. It's entertaining. I think you're really going to enjoy it. A great addition to your SOS free cookbook collection. Okay. I think that's it for today. You guys, thank you so much. This was just a tremendous amount of fun for me. I was taking lots of notes. Uh, Dr. Goldhammer is just such a wealth of knowledge and we really were excited to have him here today. So we'll see you all next week. Anything else, Tom? Okay. I'm Tammy and I help you get healthy and stay healthy one meal at a